definitely something that in the future you should be able to come back to and reference and, um, you know, use in the future, maybe jump to certain sections of it to see what you want to do uh, if you're working on your lead or if you're working on the center portion of your sales message or if you're working on the close, then you might need to kind of jump back and take a look at what we talked about here. So let me pull up my screen. Looks like people are starting to show up. We are uh, good. It sounds like my audio is working. Hopefully the screen. Can you guys now see the keynote screen that I have up here? All right, cool. Um, yes, James, we will get copies of this recording. 100% that will be available after this. It'll You'll be able to come back to it and reference it for sure. Okay, should we take notes? I think that you should take notes. Yeah, if you have a pen and paper around, I think you should definitely take notes. Part of actually, the good thing about notes is that you actually sit and you actually pay attention to it. Um, I've been noticing more and more in myself that I'm on Netflix if I'm watching something or I'm on, or let's say I'm watching TV or watching Netflix or something. I'm also on my phone. So I can imagine people that are on their computer right now have another tab open. You're probably on Facebook right now refreshing. There's just all kinds of stuff going on like that. And I know that it's happening. You're probably on your phone. So if you want to jump off those things, that would be great. I've got a little slide for that in just a second, but cool. Will I be selling the replay? Does anybody that's here right now, you should be a customer of some sort. So there's nothing that I'm going to sell to you specifically if you're here right now. If you're listening to this, you are part of this group. You will be getting the replays. You'll, get, you'll be getting everything. Okay? All right, so I'm going to take a sip of water, and we're going to get going. And I'm going to wait a second, and then I'm going to hit a, hit a clap just so for editing purposes, and then we'll get rolling. Everybody take a deep breath. Here we go. All right. Welcome to the sales page seminar presented by Copy Hour, copyhour.com. This is Derek Johansson. Today we have a lot to get through. We're going to be talking about writing a sales page from start to finish. So first of all, uh, getting a lot of questions about this, but we will have recordings. There will be a replay of this available to you at all times. You should be watching a replay right now for many of you uh, in the future that will be listening to this. So there will be replays. There'll, there'll be plenty of materials at the end for you to go through. If you could just take a moment before we begin to put your cell phone away, throw it in the other room if you have a case on it, close your browser tabs, no Netflix in the background. If you could just give me your attention for a few hours, this could be worth a lot of money to you. These sales pages are worth a lot of money. They're worth your time. It's worth it to pay attention in this particular moment. And also, I have a story that I need you to hear right now. I have the only story I want you to hear right now. So I'm going to try and make this interesting. This is something I don't see too many other people do. What I want to do is tell you how to write a sales page using a copywriting fable. And this fable will be about Gary. So it seems like a lot of the most famous copywriters in the world are named Gary. So why don't we make our copywriting fable about a new freelancer named Gary. This is Gary. This is a pixelated Gary. I don't know why that's pixelated. Gary is a freelance copywriter who needs to write a sales page for a client. Gary's client is in the health and fitness industry, specifically the paleo market. So that's Gary's client right there. Sheila, she's in the paleo market. She sells products on paleo diets and paleo fitness. They have a new online course that helps people lose fat. The course combines nutrition and an exercise routine in order to achieve fat loss, and they need a sales page that they can drive traffic to. 
how should Gary get started and write a sales page for their new course? Well, let me show you how with this sales message structure and research process. We're going to use Gary's story to show you how to do research and come up with the big idea, the big promise behind your sales page, how to write a headline for your sales page, how to start or open your message, what to say in the middle or the meat, meaty section of your sales page, how to introduce your product and describe the features and the benefits of those features, and how to close a sales page and get the sale. I have to say again that there is nothing for sale in this presentation. This is completely content. So there is no slides at the very end. I could scroll down and show you. There is nothing down here at the very end of this thing that has anything to do with sales. Pure content, here we go. I, me, the person you're listening to, this is Derek Johansson. Um, I show you guys this stuff, no fancy headshots. That's me and half of my wife's face there. Um, grandmas love them, that's me there as well. No fancy headshots. I am not a business guru by any means. Uh, I, I don't have fancy headshots. I don't have a fancy website um, because I am working on my own businesses, doing my own thing, and I have no need for those fancy headshots. Um, I just wanted to, to kind of point that out. Um, there have been, at this point, it, there's too many to count. It sounds like I'm bragging, but it, it, it's true. There have been a lot of different big companies um, billion dollar companies, Automatic, who does WordPress, has sent people through Copy Hour, which is basically, Copy Hour is basically um, this training on steroids. So <laughs> I love uh, referring to stuff as X on steroids. So this training, the sales page seminar, um, is a, uh, a slightly less intense version of what Copy Hour is. So um, Evan Pagan's team has sent people through Athletic Greens, Ramit Sethi. Um, these people down below have mentioned my product or myself as, as somebody to pay attention to. Um, and then this is Ian Stanley, and I just love this screen grab here. Um, Ian knows how to sell. So Ian, the words that Ian has written online have helped produce over $50 million at this point. And another thing to keep in mind with Ian is he was part of the story that I've, I've told in the past about making $46,000 for about two hours of work and that number continues to grow. So at, at a certain point, he'll probably be at about $50,000 an hour for the work that he did rewriting just the lead of one uh, video, of one video sales letter. So this is Ian here. Uh, another thing to keep in mind with Ian is that he is also working on his own businesses and this is uh, his business fixed water and they've kind of just gotten off the ground within the last five or six months selling water filters and using all these concepts using these principles so we had a vsl course that we put together um, that use it, used this same structure that we're going to show you so this structure has been used in countless different niches markets etc with success and we're still using it today. So I just want you to know that we're still using this. We're still applying the principles that you're going to learn today. Uh, we've worked in the credit repair uh, space, uh, acting career advice, uh, yoga instructor is kind of a yoga master, dating and relationships, fitness, and then paleo, which uh, our, our Gary character is working on today. So this will work for sales pages. This is going to work for a sales letter, which can be, you know, pretty much those two can be pretty interchangeable. Um, a VSLs and then home pages. So a VSL and a sales letter are pretty much the same thing these days. Um, and then home pages. So the home page thing, uh, I'm using this in the in the beauty industry. We have a subscription box. Our home page follows this formula, but it's just a lot less words basically it's it's a lot shorter um, for the home page but it follows this template this structure exactly and we're having really good success with 
um, with the homepage at this point in the beginning stages um, of our business there. So you can use this structure if you, and there are some optional portions of it, which you'll see. So there's the optional building blocks that you can remove and you could use it for a homepage. It's just kind of, I wouldn't say watered down, I would just say less words really, just shorter for a homepage. If you wanted to go out and write a homepage for yourself, for a client, et cetera. All right, back to Gary. Let's get started. So here is where the content begins. What I really wanted to do in that first section is just kind of get you excited and let you know that you're in the right place as far as knowing that this structure works and that you're gonna be able to apply it to your own sales page, to a client sales page. Okay, so let's get started with Pixelated Gary and get going. The first thing that you have to do is you have to sit down and do research. It makes sense, right? You start with the product and that's all you have to begin. What do you do to get started? Well, you need to sit down and you need to do research. Within research, there are a couple different phases. Um, and this is kind of my unique process for this stuff. And uh, I hope that this also works for you. I know it'll work for you if you actually do it. So phase one, focus your brain. Um, here is a maxim, which is just kind of a short, pithy statement to describe a, a general principle. The majority of your research has already been done by somebody else. So if you're just getting started, have confidence that there has somebody else that's pretty much done all of the work for you. Okay? Not all of it. I would say 90% of it. Somebody else has already done most of the work. What your job is going to be is going to fill in that last 10%. And if you really want something to sell, you're going you're gonna to hope that you can um, get really good at this stuff and be able to, you know, you're the one kind of innovating. Okay? So phase one is focus your brain. Here we go. Step zero. This might be a review for some copy hour members, but step zero, read books on selling and consumer psychology. So we have a list of essential books on copywriting and sales um, that you can check out. This is just something that as you get started in your career, you should start doing. Just reading these books on consumer psychology, why people buy stuff, and that's one kind of 80-20 of copywriting is that if you can if you can have some of the basic principles of why people buy, then the words, it's not about fancy words. Like copywriting sometimes is like more seen as like the fancy stuff. Um, but if you have that underlying fundamentals, if you have the stuff that actually makes people sell in there, the principles of, of sales in your writing, then, then you don't have to have the prettiest construction. Of, of words, okay? It doesn't, you don't have to have the best copy in the world. This will get you 80% of the way there, okay? So read books on selling and consumer psychology. We have a list to get started right there. And this is something else too that you're gonna see why if you're a freelancer, it's really important to start to niche down. Find what you're good at, find what you're good at selling, and when you can niche down, you're going to be able to write this stuff a lot faster because your research will pretty much already be done moving from client to client. So if you can niche down into the paleo market and be the paleo copywriter, I, you know, it's going to depend on how many clients you can end up finding, et cetera, but that will be a great place to start for you. Okay. Phase one, what's the product? Step one. What's the product you'll be selling? First, you're just going to write it down. Is it a book? Is it a course? Is it a physical product? Is it a strategy session? All you're doing is just writing down the product type. The second part is, does your product exist already? And really all that means, is it capable of being sold right now? Yes or no? So you're just kind of answering these two questions, and you'll see why we do this in just a second. But just answer those two questions. So for Gary, what he'd do 
would he would just write down online course, and then for uh, B he would write yes because his clients have shared all the videos and the course materials with them. Maybe they've already built the membership site, etc. So he would just take all that information, write down yes, and go from there. Very simple step. If you're following along, just think about what you've got and you can write down the same things for your own stuff. If it's a physical product, obviously you're hoping that it already exists. It might be in the manufacturing stage. You don't know exactly where it is right now. Um, and this is pretty easy to write down uh, for step A. Step two is market sophistication. So this basically just tells you where the marketplace is. Um, and there are, there are more than three stages that a lot of different people will point to. I like to keep it easy with three because it's just a lot easier to understand it in this way. So stage one is you're brand new to market. Your product or service is brand new. Your market will never have seen a product like this before. Uh, what's really interesting is if you can take a product and make it into something that's brand new, as far as you can introduce it or talk about it as if it's brand new, um, you are in a good place. The only issue that comes up there is if, you, if you're not sure about the market. So you need to be 100% sure about that market in order to use stage one. Um, but anyways, that, I, I'm getting a, you know, getting a little bit further out than I'd like to be. So is this product or service completely brand new? Your market will never have seen the product before. Stage two, are you second, second to market? So like Lyft to Uber. Are, are you a newer product, but there are only a few competitors? So in that case, it would be Lyft would be kind of that second-ish to market. Um, okay, I just got to, I got, if, if there are any problems with the recording, go ahead and let me know in the questions box just because I got a little warning message. So second-ish to market, you have a newer product, but there are a few competitors. Are you in a market that's crowded and people are becoming jaded with big claims? So Stage three is something that's extremely crowded. There are a lot of competitors. There are a lot of products that do what your product claims to do. That is when you have a big crowded market. And this is when people are becoming jaded with what marketers are saying about their product. They're jaded about the big promises that have been made. And you need to speak to them in a different way in that case. Okay, so if you're in stage one, first to bring a product to market, in this case, you can be direct. All you need to do is tell people what your product can do. You're going to name the features and the benefits of your product in that case. If you're in stage two, this is a newer product, but there are competitors. So you need to enlarge your claims. You basically need to make your promises better. What is your, make your, yeah, make your bolder claims in your competition. Is your product better, faster, stronger, et cetera, than your competitors? And put some measurability to it to one up your competitors. We're three times as fast. We have the fastest hard drive. We have the fastest whatever. We have the strongest composite steel, stuff like that. That's what you would be doing in stage two. So it's a little bit less direct. Um, kind of right in that middle area, telling people what you can do, making a promise. And because there aren't a ton of other people making the same promises, you can be a little bit more direct. They're not going to be as jaded. If you're in stage three, the market is getting jaded with exaggerated claims. You'll need to choose a marketing angle which highlights the features in a different way. So that is what stage Gary's going to be in here. So Gary, and I, and I put guesses because you don't have to get super tied up in this stuff in the beginning, especially if you're not super familiar with the market, and especially during the research phase, because right now all we're doing in phase one is just focusing the brain. So it's not about being absolutely 100% correct in this stuff. It's just about getting a guess together, 
getting some, starting to make some assumptions that you can then test later down the road. So in our case, Gary is going to guess stage three because from what he can tell, there's a lot of competition. There's a lot of people in the diet and fitness industry. There's a lot of people now in the paleo industry. So he's going to take a look at all that competition or he just knows. And he's going to see there are a lot of companies selling products in those particular spaces. So he's just going to stay, say stage three. And right now, if you can, just make your best guess. Just make your best guess about exactly where you are right now. And then I'll show you how to use that in just a second. Step three is to just think about your medium. So how exactly will you be, de be delivering the sales message? So you're going to be selling through an online sales page um, or a VSL. Is it a home page? Uh, this doesn't really apply to you guys, but uh, this might apply in the future if you're writing for something else. Through a direct mail package, an email series, a phone consultation, Google AdWords banner uh, to a sales page, so like a display ad to a sales page. So what is the medium? In our case, we're thinking about a sales page or a home page. Okay, if you're unsure, uh, what are your direct competitors doing? So what are your indirect competitors doing um, as well? So just look at what's happening out there. Um, if a lot of people are selling through a sales page out there, then uh, that's probably where you're going to want to live. If there are not people doing that, then you got to kind of decide whether or not there's a gap there and that doing a sales page would be something that would be interesting and attract them or whether or not that is actually just like a fool's errand and you shouldn't do it. Okay. So in this case, you, you know, for A here, just write down online sales page or home page. Probably most of you are in the sales page area right now. So simply, obviously, because this is what he got hired to do, Gary would write down sales page. All right. Now we're going to pick an awareness level. So again, we're just making a guess here. You don't have to be 100% sure. And because what we're going to do is we're going to use this chart to end up choosing a lead. And what the lead is, is a lead is how you start the sales message, how you start the sales page. That's it. It's the first two to 600 words and it's just how to start. So everybody freaks out about how to start a sales page or start a sales message. It's just lead choice, just a lead. That's how you start. So this helps you figure that part out. So, for this, uh, for what we're doing here, we're just going to pick an awareness level, and there are three factors that we're kind of weighing with our um, with our uh, our lead choice. This is a little misleading here, the text, but um, we're going to weigh the market sophistication. We're going to weigh, weigh the awareness levels, which I'll describe in just a second, and then we're going to weigh what's happening here: um, customer lists, retargeting. Um, is in the direct side. This is in indirect is paid advertising. Um, so like if you're doing a paid ad to a sales page, then you're probably going to want to be in this area, but it also depends on market sophistication. And you just kind of kind of just use this to figure out where you are. And these are the different lead types. And again, leads is just the way that you start the sales message. So all this chart does up here, all the scale does, is help you make a decision about which one of these to test first. Okay. So there are five different awareness levels. We have most aware, product aware, solution aware, problem aware, and unaware. Unaware. So unaware, Ursula, if we're... Now we're going back to Gary's example here. So Gary's operating in the paleo space. Remember, they have an online course. What he's doing is trying to figure out where people are coming from. Um, and Gary's client, and I actually have another slide down here that tells you what Gary client, Gary's client is looking for. But um, let's just talk about these awareness levels real quick. So 
Um, unaware, Ursula doesn't know she has a weight problem, but probably does. So she is somebody that is overweight, but she's unaware of that problem. She's unaware of the solutions. So the solution in this case, let's just say, would be paleo. Like paleo would be the solution. And then the products, in this case, these would be the products like uh, paleo books, paleo ebooks, recipes, etc. Um, so she's unaware of all this stuff. So she's over here. And skeptical people and unaware people kind of operate in the same mental space. You need to approach them in an indirect way. Okay, problem aware. Problem aware, Patty is aware of her problem. So in this case, that would be she's aware that she's um, overweight. Uh, so she's aware of a problem that she's either A, but she's either uh, not actively searching for a solution or isn't really aware of a solution. So when I say solution, again, I mean this is the paleo diet. So she's not actively searching for diet plans. She's not active, actively su uh, searching for paleo diet plans. She's not even really aware of paleo diets. Solution aware. Like problem aware Patty, solution aware Sally knows she has a problem. But she's aware that there's a solution to her problem. So she knows, in this case, she knows about the paleo diet. But she hasn't gone as far to search for brands or the products out there that could help her with this, uh, with paleo. Um, but she's getting ready to. She's like on the verge of starting to do the research on this stuff. Product aware people. So we have solution aware Sally <laughs> and product aware Petunia. So she's aware of her problem and she's, she's aware that there's a solution, which is the paleo diet. And she's taken it to the next level and actually started researching products and brands. So she knows the options out there and generally the prices. Okay. Now there's most aware and this is Ali aware. She is all the things that product aware Petunia is, but she's hyper aware and on the verge of buying. She just needs to hear the right deal and she'll pull the trigger. So she's done all the research. She knows about the paleo diet. She knows about all the different ebooks. Maybe she's got a favorite kind of fitness guru or something and she's on some lists and she's getting ready to pull the trigger. She's just kind of looking for that right deal. And in that case, that's somebody that you can approach in a direct way because she's ready to go. She just needs to hear the deal. These are hot leads. These are customers. These are people that know who you are, know about your company and like you, trust you and are ready to, ready to get started and pull the trigger. Okay. So with all that stuff in mind, again, what you're trying to do is say, okay, I'm in level two of market sophistication. There's like one other, one or two other companies doing what I'm doing, selling the same product as me. Um, but maybe I have a problem aware customer. So in that case, I'm thinking, and because we're talking about a sales page, I know that I'm probably a little bit more to the right of this section, or maybe I have, um, maybe it's a customer list, so I could be more towards this way. See, see what you got to do. You got to figure out if it's a customer list, you got to figure out what these people know about you. You have to figure out their awareness level in some way there. Um, so if you're in level two, and you, it's a customer list, you might be able to go into this promise territory. If it's level two and it's a non-customer list and it's a coming from a paid advertisement, you're gonna wanna start heading this way. And in that case, you might choose to go with a secret or a proclamation or a story to start your sales message. And if you're in level three and people are skeptical, they're hearing all these big claims, um, and it's a customer list, you could probably still go into this area. But if it's level three or the skeptical territory and it's a uh, paid advertisement sales page, people are kind of don't really know who you are. 
when they hit your page, then you're going to want to go this direction. All right, so for everybody that's here live, I hope that makes sense. Um, at this point, you should just make a guess, right? Just make a guess. Here's a little bit more to help. Go direct when you're selling a product that's easy to understand. You can make a promise that's very large and easily accepted. So um, if there's something that you can solve and it's people aren't going to be skeptical about what you're saying, then you can just say it outright. You can just promise it. If you literally have the car with the most horsepower around and it's testable and everybody knows it's, that's easily accepted, then you can just say, we have the most horsepower and then you could maybe even make the promise we have the fastest car or something like that. Okay. So um, you've got an exceptionally good deal or guaranteed offer. You've got a flash crazy fire sale, 70, 90, 8, 95% off free. You can go, um, you can go direct in that case. Uh, your customer knows and trusts you and deals with you very often. In that case, uh, you have a good relationship with them kind of on that customer side of the scale, you can be more direct. You've, you've made a product improvement your market was already waiting for. You're the first to introduce this. And people were really excited about what, about what you're going to introduce, um, about this new innovation, and you're the first to do it. You can just tell people what this is going to do for you. So, you know, I don't know, maybe in the cycling market, if it was the some new type of wheel, carbon wheel was going to come out and everybody's waiting for it to happen and then they made it and then that that particular company could say uh, introducing the new this new carbon wheel. This is the fastest wheel on the market and people would easily accept that you can go direct in that case. All right, more indirect when your customer trusts you less as a resource than you might imagine. This is where most of us live. Your customer just doesn't trust the scope of your claims. Your customer doesn't believe a solution to his problem is possible. They just don't believe what you're saying. They just don't believe that uh, they could lose weight themselves, um, etc. That they don't believe that you can lose weight without surgery. Uh, without a, you know, without liposuction or without a uh, stapling their stomach or something, then this would be where you'd be. Your customer doesn't even know there's a problem worth solving. So very unaware person. They're not even, they didn't even really know that they were overweight. They didn't even know that there were dating products out there in the marketplace that could help them, you know, find a wife or something. Your claims all sound too much like everybody else's. If you've got a product in a crowded space, you probably have the same promises, the same benefits to your product as other people. In that case, you're going to want to go a little bit more indirect because what you get is people thinking, okay, I've heard it all before. You're selling something that needs a lot of explanation. So before, kind of even 10 years ago at this point, if you were selling like an online course where somebody had to log into a membership site and watch videos and all this other stuff, that was kind of like people didn't really get it. It wasn't a physical book. It wasn't an ebook. So you had to kind of describe what was going to happen and what was the benefit of all that stuff. What was the benefit of having a membership site that you could log into at any time? Um, so you have, if you have to, ha if you have something that needs a lot of explanation, if it's a really complicated product or it solves a very complicated problem, then you're going to want to go more indirect. Um, more indirect if your product has a timely news connection too big to ignore. If you sell green cards to the various countries that just got blocked, then <laughs> you might want to go indirect with a, a big, a big mention of that. Um, okay. Leads. Okay. Uh, here's just a, another little thing to help you. Maybe if I zoom out a little bit, it might help. Um, the less your product knows, prospect knows about you, what you're selling, or his own needs, the less effective a direct lead is likely to be. So this is a really nice little uh, example that I like. Uh, empires like to fight direct wars. Barbarians, the American revolutionaries, fought indirectly. 
guerrilla warfare. They didn't have the big forces. They, they weren't um, known commodities. And that's how they chose to fight. They fought very indirectly, kind of in the forest, kind of coming at the big target. Okay? So, all that said, just make a choice here. Where you think you're going to start. You're going to start in the offer, in the promise, in the problem solution area, in the secret area, proclamation or story area. With us, I would say err to the right. When in doubt, go to the right of this scale. All right. So back to Gary. Gary asks his client who who will be seeing this, like who's going to be seeing the sales page? Who is the customer? Uh, or sorry, who is the prospect that is going to be seeing the sales page? They say leads at first, so they're maybe their customer email list, but their main goal is to send paid traffic to it. So in this case, Gary is, decides that he wants to focus on paid traffic. He wants to build a sales letter that maybe they'll turn into a DSL that could be sent, that paid traffic could be sent to. Maybe they find that they need to send people to a blog post or an advertorial first before it goes to the sales page. But ultimately, he's writing a sales letter that cold traffic could see and that would convert. So what does he do? He decides to go this way. Gary weighs his option, options and decides he should go indirect because he's got a lot of competition. He's in that market sophistication level three. He figures he can't go wrong and he can always change his mind later. So again, you can change your mind on this stuff. You don't have to nail it on your first try. If you screw up, you're not in trouble. It's not going to, it's not gonna be a big deal. Especially if you're working with a client that has an offer already. If they've got an offer that's converting already, you know it's not the offer, you can go in and do what Ian did and rewrite the lead and maybe that'll give, a, give them a boost in conversions. So you don't have to be right on the first try, just give it a shot. And all we're doing with this research process as well is when you're researching, this, this, this phase one is just focusing your brain. So Gary's gonna start thinking about secrets, he's gonna start thinking about quiz questions he could ask people, he's gonna start looking for unusual stories the prospect might wanna hear. All while he's doing his research, that's all he's trying to do with his research is just uncover these things because he knows that he's going to go indirect. So he knows that he needs to find maybe a secret or he needs to find a quiz question that he could ask of people um, that they might, you know, might grab attention. He needs to find maybe the unusual story about the product or about one of the benefits of the product. So he's just focusing his brain. And if he's, if he's wrong, and if in his research, which we're going to keep talking about in a second, if in his research he discovers that um, he, maybe the market wasn't as unaware as he thought, or maybe the product actually has something about it that he could make into something brand new, so maybe he decides that he's going to go a little bit more direct with what he's doing. All right. So at this point, <clears throat> up until now, all you've really, all you really have done is focus your brain on what you should be thinking about, and it's kind of, it's interesting because you ne haven't necessarily been through leads yet. So I'm going to tell you about all the leads, and then um, once you see or hear what a lead is, then you can go back and try to understand uh, from there what to look for in your research based on the type of lead that you chose. All right. Research phase two. This is market and competitive research. Again, the majority of your research has already been done by somebody else. For those freelancers out there, it's best to work with companies that already have a converting offer. Working with startups is not fun because they don't know what their offer is. They don't know if it's going to work. They've just got this idea and you can make a lot of money with those people, but if you're just starting out, it's going to be really hard because you're not going to know, you're not going to know what is not working. You're not going to know if you are the one that's not working, if your writing isn't working, 
or you're not going to know if it's just the offer and it's not what people want. So <clears throat> it's best to work with established companies, especially established companies that understand direct sales, direct marketing. Okay. Especially if you want, if you want to be in the copywriting game, at least. And you know what? You can take all the stuff that you apply here and, and take it to like big brands and that kind of advertising as well. If you, under, if you start with understanding direct response, how things work, you're going to understand those underlying uh, principles of sales, and then you can apply that to the bigger brand stuff. Okay, phase two, market and competitive research. Uh, the maxim here is the majority of your research has already been done by somebody else. Just remember that. Discovery and offer extraction. Let me take a quick sip of water here. Okay, step five, find your direct competitor sales materials. So these are people selling the same exact type of product as you. In this case, that would be courses, online courses for paleo. But if there's like an online course for dieting, paleo dieting, or an online course for, uh, I know that paleo people like CrossFit. So there's probably some like paleo uh, CrossFit hybrid type fitness course, anything that's like that. So if you've got a hybrid, the, the, remember the, the course that we're selling, that Gary's selling, is a hybrid um, diet and kind of fitness course, paleo, for paleo people. So he's going to try and find those competitors that are um, selling the same exact type of product. So use Google, use Amazon, use AdBeat, use Facebook. Um, AdBeat.com is great. Guys, if you can afford it, it's I think 75 bucks a month for the Google version where you, can, where you just get to see the Google display network and see how advertisers are advertising there. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit more for the, the content marketing uh, networks. So um, I recommend AdBeat. Uh, pay closest attention to the sales materials that match your chosen medium. So in our case, you're going to want to look at the courses that are selling through a sales page. Okay, so let's look at how Gary would do it. Gary first goes to Amazon and finds books on paleo. I think that's a great place to start, especially in the information space. Go find the biggest authors out there and then kind of work your way back from there. So look at the author's names and Google them. Uh, find their websites and look at, you know, look for their courses, look for their other products. Look for any of their live events if you're selling a live event, etc. So look whatever matches whatever you're doing. You can do the same thing with a physical product. You could start on Amazon and then work your way back from there. Um, so this works kind of in whatever way you want. Search Facebook. Um, find the biggest groups that have this stuff. Then look at who's behind these groups. What, what, what website is behind these groups? Find the courses. Go to AdBeat and do some research on those competitors. See what they're doing, how much they're spending, what kind of ads they're creating, etc. And then just take a guess from there who the top three are. Who are who have good copy? You're probably going to want to find the people that have the best copy, just because it's easy to to look at those. And and uh, just make a guess about who's the top, and then you're going to just collect their information and you're going to hand copy their sales material. So hand copy the sales message of the top one to three competitors. So that's what copy hour is all about, right? Is hand copying those sales messages. Um, and when you hand copy, you really implant this stuff in your brain more than if you don't. And um, so, I mean, that's part of what makes copy hour different is, is the hand copying element. Of everything. So if you can get in there and hand copy, you're going to be a lot better off than just looking at it and trying to study it that way. Okay, so what you want to do at this point, write down headlines and subheadlines down on note cards. What are the headlines that they use in their sales pages for their online course in this example? Look for their promises. What are they saying they can do? What are they saying their product is going to do for you? Write a promise on a note card. Um, so the best sales messages, the best sales letters, pages are going to have one main promise. And it's going to be stated in a lot of different ways. 
So if you can't find a ton of unique promises, don't stress on it. There's going to be one big thing that they say they can do, and they'll probably come back to it over and over and over again. So in a lot of cases, like with the diet fitness stuff, it's just a promise about how much weight you can lose type of thing. And then they're going to, they're going to come back to it again and again. A new promise in this case might be something about you'll be healthier, you'll look better, et cetera. But there's that big promise of losing a certain amount of weight or something. All right. Uh, when you found the, the promises that they make, how do they back those promises up? What's the proof that they provide? So if they say you're going to do this, what is the, if you're going to lose 15 pounds or whatever it might be, how do they back that up? What are the, pro, what are the proof elements that go into it? What are the studies that they have? What are the testimonials? What are the articles that they point to? Um, put that onto a note card as well on the other side. I like to use note cards because you can just flip through them at all times. You can get a little shoebox together and have note cards and just kind of flip through them. All right. Look at their offer. An offer is just the features that make up a product. And we're going to talk about uh, features and, and benefits in just a second. So just bear with me. Um, write each feature of their product on a note card. On the back side of your feature note card, write the benefits that they say the product provides. So there's going to be overlap with the promises. There's going to be overlap with the claims and the proof that we did in the, in the last section. So don't worry about that. Um, we're going to talk about features in just a second, but a feature is basically just what your product actually is or a, a, a part of your product. So I'm holding uh, this water bottle right now, and there's a strap on the water bottle. So a, the feature is the strap, and then a benefit of the strap is that I, it's easy to carry the water bottle. That's kind of an easy way to, to think about a feature. Okay, now you're gonna wanna look for uh, unique to their product objections. So there's this article here that just talks about objections. Um, an objection is something like, well, what happens if I'm 82? That would be an objection. Or what happens if I don't have an internet connection? Or what happens if X, Y, Z? Those are objections. See what, those, what type of objections they handle when it comes to their product, maybe the delivery of their product, et cetera. And then the last thing you want to look for is customer demographics. So are you a senior over 65? If they write something like that, then you know that they're targeting seniors over 65. Make sense? Write all that stuff down on note cards. If you don't have direct competitors, look at your indirect competitors. So these are people, the top one to three most successful companies in the same market that don't have the same product type. So they're selling to the same type of people, but they have a completely different type of product. Repeat the steps above. So if you're brand new first to market and you don't have any competitors to look at, what you want to do is look at the companies who are using the same medium as you who you'd like to model. So if you're brand new, nobody else is doing what you're doing, nobody else is selling the type of product that you're selling, what you want to do is find other sales pages out there that you think could work, uh, that you like, that you, that you know are working, and model what those people are doing and take a look at their sales material and see how they're talking to their audience. All right. So... What Gary would do in this case is basically just gather up those competitors that he had in the, in the other step and hand copy their stuff and then put all of their, put all their stuff down onto note cards. So at that point, you've got a ton of note cards, really. You've got, you've been hand copying some of the best, hopefully the best sales letters, sales pages in your market. And now you have a ton of information about what they're doing, how they're selling, how they're talking to people, and then you can move on from there. And you probably already have a ton of ideas going in your head based on the type of lead that you chose. Okay. In this stage, so step six is just taking a deeper dive into all of this. So what you're really doing, you're still focusing on what you, you had from phase one. So phase one, if you, if you picked a story lead, 
or something like that, then you're going to be focusing on those stories. Like, what stories am I seeing? What stories do I see these other people telling? Um, okay. But this is a little bit more focused on your product here coming up. So step two, deeper, or step six here, find studies related to your product. So Google is your friend. Again, look for scientific journals. If you're working with the client, they should already have a lot of this stuff. This should already be there. Um, you know, it depends. Maybe some of them won't, but the, you know, if you can find some scientific journals that, that point to uh, paleo, in this case for Gary, like paleo being something that's helpful, then he would find those, those, uh, those journals. And you can easily find this stuff just by Googling. Trust me, just type in scientific journal um, for diet and nutrition and see what pops up. You're going to find some scientific journals. Um, gather your testimonials. If Hopefully your client has testimonials, especially if they have a converting offer, they probably have testimonials. Gather those things up. Get your third uh, party credibility. Um, so who can you kind of lean on? What kind of uh, big websites or big publications have mentioned your product and or mentioned paleo? And you can then kind of borrow their credibility in your sales letter, it's like, well, the New York Times said X, Y, Z, okay? The other thing you should do, and if your client hasn't done this, this would be a great value add that you could charge for, conduct surveys. Survey your audience. Uh, Ryan Levesque's ask method is the, the big method here that you're gonna wanna take a look at. E, read blogs and articles that cover your topic both directly and indirectly. So again, look for headlines, promises, claims and proof. So what you're doing is you're looking at other paleo blogs or other articles that are out there on paleo, um, looking at the headlines in those blogs. How are people talking to people? Also, you might want to look in just like the diet industry in general. Who are the biggest diet fitness people out there? What kind of headlines are they using? What kind of promises? What kind of claims? What are their proof? You're just kind of absorbing this information. You're gonna to wanna to read forum posts and Reddit discussions. Take some notes. S type forum in your subject and see what pops up. Type Reddit in your subject and kind of go down the rabbit hole and see what pops up. Look for stories. Even if, you're, even if you're not using a story lead, look for stories during the entire process because stories are so powerful. You can use them in, throughout your sales message, throughout your sales letter, in your ads, whatever, okay? Put everything on note cards. I like to put everything on note cards. You could put it in a spreadsheet if you really wanted. That's kind of up to you what your process ends up being. And I hope that you can see after looking at this stuff why it's so important to, to kind of niche yourself down, right? Because having to do this for every new market that you go into would be exhausting. It really would if you had to do this every single different time. There's so much stuff to look at. So if you can niche down, you're gonna be a lot better off. All right, step six for Gary, he's just gonna use Google and coordinate with his client to, to gather all those materials. That's it, simple. All right, so at this point, what we've done, I know it seems like we haven't done a lot of writing and we haven't, we've done a little bit of hand copy and we've done a lot of research but that's what it takes. I mean, that's what that's what's going to happen. Uh, that's just what's going to make your life so easy if you knock this stuff out. And then now it comes time to write. You have everything that you need right in front of you. You know the gaps based on on what you see your product has and what it doesn't have compared to what your mark what your competitors have and what they don't have. All right, so at this stage in the game, you've knocked out your competitive research, gathered a lot of information, start flipping through your note cards and saying, hmm, interesting. Just like look at them, start flipping through them, look at the headlines, look at the offer, look at the features, look at the benefits. So phase three now, your product and offer. This is where you're just going to build your own offer, and this is bullet stuff. Okay, so now we're actually going to get into a little bit of writing, but um, we're still in what I deem the research phase. So step seven is build your offer. 
What you want to do is consume the product, read it, use it, get it delivered, and open it. Read through the course, the book, at least once. So open up the membership site. Dive in there. Go through everything front to back. If you can actually do what the product says, if you can try it yourself, that's even better because you're going to have a really intimate understanding of what's going on. Um, that would be the best. So Gary's going to log into the membership area. He's going to consume the product front to back. Maybe Gary doesn't actually have to go through the product, but it would probably be best if he did. If it's a physical product, open it up, look at it, check it out, have it sent to yourself. What's it like to open it? What does it look like? How does it feel, etc. So this next point, this next part is just read it again. So there's the first initial, just read through something. Then there's the second time through where you start taking notes on it. Okay, so take notes on the features of the product. And again, we're just about to get to what features and benefits are. Um, put each feature on its own note card. On the back side, write out potential benefits that the feature can provide to the customer. Uh, the, a lot of times those benefits are your claims. What's a piece of supporting proof you could give to that claim? So if I say um, that this strap, that's the, the strap on this water bottle is the feature. The benefit is that I can hold it easily. Well, how do I back that up with proof? It could just be a picture of somebody holding it. Um, maybe you could go as far to say, it's made of um, a certain material that never breaks, um, or you could say it's ergonomically designed, something that's gonna back up that claim that I make. And then proof would be maybe a, you know, you link the study um, on this particular type of fiber, or you say the New York Times called this fiber the greatest new thing since sliced bread, or this scientific journal says this fiber is amazing. Obviously, selling a strap on a water bottle is probably not that hard as far as you don't need to go that far. All right. Take note of any stories. Again, go through that product. There's probably some stories in there. Books, authors like stories. So go through there. Find those stories. Um, then also find what their objections they're addressing in the product. So. Um, if there is a section about how to do something, if that person's busy, like how to, how to cook quickly if you're busy, the objection would be, well, I'm busy. I'm too busy to do this. I'm not gonna have enough time to do this. So a lot of times the author, the person that created the course, et cetera, will have a objections that they're handling throughout the course. So just take note of that stuff and write it down. All right, so now at this point you should have your features, you should have your benefits, and you should have some objections. Let's talk about features and benefits. Here's another example of a feature and a benefit. Um, coffee cups are a, a good example. The, the handle on a coffee cup is the feature. So uh, that is uh, the feature. The benefit is that that handle allows you to not have your hand get burned. Your hand will not be burned if you um, have the handle. And then there's a thing called dimensionalizing a, a benefit. Um, and this, is, uh, this was made by one of our Copy R members, Ian. Um, having hands that don't bleed makes life awesome. You just kind of put words, like picture words, to a benefit. You really get in there and describe the benefit in an interesting, like kind of picture-heavy way. And I'll give you another example in just a second. So bullets, um, offer, a lot of times the offer is just the bullet. Um, so like the bullets, and a bullet is, all it is is a formatting feature, but, but it is most often a feature and then a benefit. So you describe the feature first, and then you tell people what that, what that feature benefit, what the benefit of that feature is in the same sentence, and you put a bullet in front of it, and um, you've, you've seen these everywhere, I'm sure. All right, features. Features are just objective facts 
about a product or the company. And there's a brilliant article by Clayton Makepeace that talks about this stuff that I'll link you guys up um, on features and benefits. A really great, simple article that helps you kind of understand this stuff even more. Okay, features of physical products. So this might be size, shape, weight, construction, colors might be a feature. Um, features of informational products, this is going to be a concept. The number of pages or modules. Modules is a big one with this course that we're talking about because they're probably going to be like four or five different modules of content. So uh, number of pages or modules might be a feature. Uh, size would be a feature. And then frequency of publication, you could call a feature. This is published monthly. Um, there's also features of the company or the salesman. Degrees or certifi uh, certifications. Uh, what associations are you a member of? How many years have you been in business? How many customers do you have? Are you the largest or oldest in your area of expertise? Just kind of answering these questions. What have, what have you got? How large of an army are you putting to work on the prospect's behalf? How big is your customer service team? How big is your each individual team if you've got like a, a, a firm? What unique or proprietary tools do you use to produce the desired result? How many customer service reps are available to make ordering comfortable and easy? I already said that one. How many service techs are on your payroll who can respond when the product needs service? These are still features. Are you closer to your prospects than your competition? So these are kind of location-based ones. Are your headquarters impressive looking? Is your office close to a major intersection or freeway off-ramp? Do you offer plenty of free parking? That would be a big feature in a lot of major cities. Uh, or if you're promoting a product for a national company, how does its location help you produce a superior product? So if you've got like an investment research product, um, having it based or produced uh, on or near Wall Street would be considered a feature. Um, if it's a politically oriented product, having it produced in or near D.C., Washington, D.C., would also be kind of a, a feature of that company. Okay, um, are appointments readily available? These are just more things to get you thinking about the features of your product. Do you perform your service faster than your competition does? If I order this product, how fast will I get it? Inventory, how many different products and colors do you have available? How does that compare to what your competitors offer? Features of your product or service. So all those features above, that was for your company. And I'm going to give you the slides after this, obviously, so you can go back and take a look at those and kind of start writing all those, those things down. Okay, purpose. What exactly does your product or service do? If it accomplishes several things, great, list everything you can think of. So at this point, Gary is doing all this. He's writing down all the things that this product does. It helps you lose fat. It helps you, um, it helps you be healthier, if that's one of their claims. It helps you um, look good, et cetera. Physical dimensions. How does your product compare to competing products? Is it bit smaller, bigger, lighter, heavier duty? Um, maybe their, mo their membership uh, system, their membership uh, area is bigger. Maybe the product is longer. There's, a much, there's more content in there, something along those lines in comparison to their competitors. Performance met metrics. Does Gary's product, this paleo book, does it work faster? Um, how quickly can your product be delivered, installed, or begin producing results? How fast does your product complete the desired task? How thoroughly does it do its job? How long does it last? How do your product's performance metrics compare to similar products offered by your competitors? You just, the way it has all this stuff at the end about comparing to your competitors, because that's just a way to help you quantify what is different, what, like, what is an actual feature of your product. So if my competitor has an hour long video, um, and I've got a two hour long video, then maybe I have more content. You know, I've got a bigger product. 
Credibility. What have customers, subscribers, peers, and others said about your product? What guarantees and or warranties does it come with? How do, you com how do they compare to what your competition offers? We're, we have the most uh, certifications in XYZ. That would be a feature. Available options. What choices does your product offer to prospects? What colors or sizes does it come in? Uh, how do your terms make ordering the best fit possible for customers? Is it customizable in any way? How do these choices make your product superior to the competition? Notice there's a lot of stuff to get through, and that's part of a sales page, a sales message, right? You want to mention as many good things about your product as possible without boring people, without getting them skeptical, um, et cetera. So you want to mention all the good things that your product has to offer as long as that is interesting to people and they'll continue to read about it. How quickly, timeliness, how quickly can your product be delivered and or installed? How does this compare with the competition? Again, um, what are your prices? How do they compare to the competition? So do you deliver more for the money? Does your product's quality demand a higher price? If applicable, this is just a nice little thing. Divide your price by numbers. So 1252, 365, and then you can write down your product's cost per month, week, and day, and you can compare that to, um, you know, to other things. So features and the benefits. A simple way to look at it is keep asking why until you can't anymore. So a feature is the strap. Why does that matter? Makes it so um, it's easy to carry. Well, why does that matter? Uh, it frees up my hands to do other tasks. Well, why does that matter? Uh, well, I don't really know. I think that's the end of it. So just keep asking why until it doesn't really make any more sense to ask why. So features and the benefits. Constructed, say this water bottle was constructed of carbon steel. Why is that important? Well, it never wears out. So the benefit would be the last drill bit you'll ever buy or the last water bottle that you'll ever buy. And then to dimensionalize it, you say, you can save up to $75 a year in broken water bottles or old water bottles, hours of unnecessary trips to the hardware store or the grocery store or um, browsing on Amazon and hundreds of dollars in lost income, et cetera. So again, when you dimensionalize something, you're just painting a word picture of it um, to, of all the different ways the prospect will enjoy that benefit. All right, so that is your offer section. Okay, so um, that is the offer. The, I'm about to get to the, the 14 building blocks of a sales page. Okay, so the, I'm about to get to the actual structure of our sales page. Right now, one of the structures of the sales page is the offer. We have pretty much outlined that entire offer. So when it comes time to actually write it in our sales page, we've already pretty much done the majority of the heavy lifting at this point, and we're still in the research phase. Okay, phase three, build your offer. If you don't have a product at this point, build what you think would be an ideal offer. And this is just kind of an aside. Most of you will have that offer that you're, you're already working with. But in some cases, you could, you could build the product. Um, you could write the sales letter, excuse me. You could write the sales letter before you even build, uh, build the product itself. Just because you know the market so well, you know what they want and need. You've done so much research that at that point you can just sit down and write the sales page and then you can go back and try to make the product to match the sales page. In a lot of ways that can be a very powerful thing to do. A lot of us won't be approaching it from that angle, so I just wanted to quickly put this out there and, uh, and, and have this here just in case you need it. Okay, so in this uh, particular case, Gary is just gonna do exactly what we did with the feature benefits stuff. Um, and he's going to write down as many of the features he can think of and then as many of the benefits as he can think of. All right. That was phase three of research. Now we're headed into phase four. Very simple phase. 
This is think, then rest, then write. So what you want to do is grab your shoebox full of note cards and just flip through them, say, hmm, and that's it. Constantly flip through your competitor's note cards and your own offer note cards. I would recommend kind of keeping them separate. And flip through and, and see what's going on. Um, I like to call it minding the gap. So mind the gap. What features do they have that you don't? What promises are they making that you can't or that you're not making um, if you're rewriting a sales letter? Um, the gap might be where your opportunity is. The gap might signal the differentiation that you can point to. Um, the gap might signal that you need to add more features to your offer, or maybe you could build a bonus report. Okay, so you're just, you're just looking for where there's that little discrepancy or where there's something that they're doing that you're not doing and you need to add to your product or potentially that's the little thing that makes your product different is because you're not doing something that they're doing. So just kind of, you know, I can't tell you exactly what it's going to be, right? I'd have to actually look at your product and do the research. So you're going you're gonna to have to kind of discover those little gaps and try to fill them in. So this is what Gary does. Gary flips through his note cards and starts to realize that A, their offer, so his client's offer is lacking a key component all the competitors have. Um, say it's like a recipe book. So he suggests that his clients add a bonus recipe book to it. Or maybe they decide it's going to be an upsell after they buy the course, that there's an upsell to buy the bonus recipe book. But he makes that suggestion because he notices that it doesn't exist. Now that's an obvious glaring difference. There might, it might be something else that they need to add in there that's not quite as glaring and obvious as that. But a lot of times that might be the thing. That might be some difference in there, um, something as big as something like that that just they didn't really think about. Gary also remembers a blurb he read about um, with soldiers using a diet similar to the paleo diet to stay mentally focused during battle. So he wonders if maybe he could make that story into a secret. It's like secret diet used by military forces. He'd have to decide whether or not that was the most powerful appeal. Um, but he starts to think about those things. Um, he also takes note of a past customer who had an unusual story about losing a ton of weight with Gary's client's system. So he's just kind of thinking about these things, right? Step nine. Is a, is a nice step. At this point, you just rest. So at this point, you've done a lot. You've got a lot to consider. You've done a ton of research. It's why it's best to niche down because you're going to be able to do this stuff a lot faster. So what you want to do is you just want to get out of the office, get out of your home office, whatever. Take the weekend off. Take the weekend off of writing and researching. And then at that point, inspiration should hit. And especially with this building block, especially with the structure that I'm about to give you guys, um, you should be able to sit down from there and at least come up with that lead is what you're kind of looking to do in that section because that's the hardest thing to come up with. All right, so Gary takes the weekend off and he goes to play golf. All right, chapter two. That was just chapter one. That was a long chapter. Chapter two is the sales page structure. Okay. There are four different parts of this structure. There are really only three. The sales argument and the offer are pretty closely tied together, but it's just easier to break them apart and have you focus on building your offer kind of on its own. So um, there are four different parts that we have here, and each of these are what I'm considering the building blocks. I've called them elements in the past. Let's just call them building blocks. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. If you have each of these elements, each of these building blocks, you will have yourself a structure that is almost guaranteed to pull in some sales of some sort. Having all of these different elements should get you, let's say, 70 to 80% of the way there. 
Okay, if, as long as you have these different things, you're going to be fine. And we're going to talk about each of these right now. 14 building blocks. Some of them are optional. Um, but I think that you really should have it in some way if you can. It's really nice to have these things. So the, the bonus stuff is nice to have. The transitional creation story is great. The scarcity is probably the most powerful concept you can have. You don't have to have it there, but when you get to the close, it's really nice to have it. Okay. So, this is what you're going to use, and let's talk about each of these elements. So, that was a quick chapter. <laughs> now we're going to chapter three. This is leads. Okay. So we've already kind of talked about this a little bit. Let's talk about it a little bit more. Let's talk about each type and, and then go from there. And let's look at what Gary's going to do. So very simply, the beginning of your sales message is the lead. It's the first 200 to 600 words, and it's always going to include your headline. Often your headline could, it could just be the first line of your sales letter, your, your VSL of your sales page. Um, but, uh, you know, there's m most of the time you're going to have a headline and then what follows the first two to 600 words, it could be more. There's some of them that are a lot longer. It just kind of sets the scene. It introduces things. So there's a book that you should definitely buy, especially if you're serious about copywriting. It's called great leads, six different types of leads. We, uh, Ian Stanley and I added another couple to the mix. So we have eight time, eight types that we like to think about. So eight different lead types total. And this is just ways to start a sales message. Okay. Every lead will have a promise. The best leads have a big promise. The best leads have one singular big promise. There's something that you're promising that is that big core concept idea that you're telling people that they're going to learn by going through your sales page, going through your sales message. The big thing that you're promising you're going to do for people, that's what's found in the lead. If you have an indirect lead, it is an implied promise. You can state it outright if you want. Um, a lot of times it makes sense to do that. It's best to kind of say, um, if it's a story, for example, you're kind of saying like, this, this is what I learned. You're not saying you're going, to, you're going to get this same result. You're just gonna learn about my story almost. So it's an implied promise about what's gonna happen. And then if it's a direct lead, it is a stated promise. This is what you're going to get. This is what you're going, this is the benefit that you're going to receive. Okay. So that is, um, that's what's going on in the lead. Then the next section um, that I didn't actually even mention, I didn't mention all the sections. So uh, there's the lead, there's the sales argument, there's the offer, and then there's the close. So in the second section, this is kind of the meat. This is your middle portion of what do I say in the middle? of my sales letter. That's what we call the sales argument. So in that section, what you're doing is you're restating that big promise in different ways. You're retalking about the benefits. You're adding in new benefits. You're talking about new features, different things, and you're making supporting claims about those features. And then you're providing proof for what you're saying. That's what the sales argument and the offer do um, versus what the lead does. So the lead kind of sets the scene says this is what this is going to be all about, makes a big promise about what you're going to learn, and then in the sales argument, you further expound on what you talked about in the lead. So it's pretty easy. Um, I'll show you how to pick. There's three different types of uh, sale. Sorry, there's three different types of sales arguments, and I'll show you each of those in just a second. Let me take another sip of water here. Okay, <clears throat> so again, 
the lead stuff is down here in blue. We've got offer, we've got promise, we've got problem solution, we've got secret, we've got proclamation, scarcity, quiz, and we've got story. Story is the most indirect. Proclamation is pretty indirect as well. Secret is getting a little bit more towards the direct. Problem solution is kind of right down the middle. Promise and offer is the most direct that you can be. There are other types of leads. There's any different number of ways that you can do this. This is just the easiest way. This is just like a great way to get started. Okay, so as you get deeper into this, you can kind of make up things as you go. You don't have to follow this every single time, but it would help. This stuff definitely helps. Okay, now let's talk about each of these, starting with direct and moving right. Okay, so our example with Gary, Gary was thinking he should go indirect. Um, so he was thinking in the story region and hopefully with his research and everything else, he kind of figured out a story or something interesting in that particular case. So at this point, we're just still trying to kind of decide what type of lead we're going to choose. And then we're obviously going to sit down, and we're going to write it. So let me just quickly walk you through each different lead type and then Let's just make a guess. Again, it's simply a guess in the beginning because especially if you're getting into something new and you can write more than one lead. Like, look, Ian rewrote a lead. That was all he rewrote was a lead to a sales, let, uh, to a sales video and was able to create a bump in conversions and was able to make the kind of money that he made based on just rewriting the first part of it. So... <clears throat> Just keep that in mind. It's just a guess in the beginning. All right. So the lead in an offer lead. Again, we're direct. Maybe it's a level one person. Probably not. There's not a lot of level one people. M maybe it's probably a most aware, probably a customer list. Um, maybe retargeting. Okay, heading to the sales page. The lead is the deal or the guarantee. The most important part of an offer lead is that the prospect feels immediately that the benefit he's about to receive is both valuable and a steal by comparison. So often that steal just means it's a deal. So um, it's very important if you're going to be direct in a sales page or sales letter that people know you, like you, trust you, um, or you have this incredible, crazy deal on what you've got going. A lot of sales pages, are not necessarily going to be in this offer lead territory unless it's kind of a customer list back end type product where you can be very direct. There's a, it's hard to do paid advertising to an offer lead unless you've got some crazy deal that you've got going on and that there's some scarcity attached to it and that deal is going to be disappearing. So a lot of us are not going to be operating in this territory. Um, Maybe, yeah, here we go. Let me just open up a uh, my browser really quickly, and I'll show you a deal. All right, so now we have this message here. This is a Joseph Sugarman ad um, for a suicide sale. Obviously, wouldn't fly these days, but this is just an old example of a this isn't actually more of like a, an advertorial um, or a space ad but this would be considered an offer lead he's leading with the sale there's a huge deal it's an unusual deal that they have um, and people in copy hour very recently just uh, just hand copied this one so clearing out the warehouse most unusual sale we've ever held uh, no we haven't gone bananas and then basically just opens up how they're the big promise here is that they have this crazy sale and then he goes on to describe what this sale is and that's the offer the offer is what he's describing right up front he's describing the sale how it works what to do um, he's describing everything about the features and benefits of his offer which is this sale and these various different products all right, 
let me jump back into the keynote. Offer leads, it's very important in an offer lead to have a reason why. Why is this deal or guarantee being offered? Why are you having this big fire sale? Why is your product being sold at a discount? Why do you have this unusual guarantee? All right. I'm moving quickly through the, that one particularly because with a lot of sales pages, a lot of us are not going to be in that range unless you're doing an upsell sales page behind a product, et cetera. But let's just talk about that first one. Let's just talk about the first front end traffic type stuff. Promise leads. A promise lead works best with mostly aware prospects who are almost ready to buy. You're in this area. So they know about the products, they know about the solutions, they know about their problem. Um, maybe they don't know too much about you, um, et cetera. Maybe you're more in that level one, level two area, but you're just gonna come out and you're gonna make a promise that you can do something, that your product is gonna do something. So an example of a promise lead, these are famous old ones, a Hollywood smile in three days, promising them you're gonna get these things, how to win and win friends and influence people, that's a big one, or something like triple your money in 90 days. That would be a promise lead. Um, Masterson and Ford, so the great leads guy, uh, guys, say to find the promise, find the USP. So what does your product do that other products don't? And you want to promise to the target your prospects, you, you want the promise, excuse me, you want the promise to target your prospects core desire. What's that core thing that they really want and you're just gonna uncover that and promise it to them and tell them that your product is unique and can, and can that you can back up, that you can actually provide this promise to them. So part of a successful promise lead is having an intimate understanding of what's been promised by marketers in the past. Do they often over promise and under deliver? Um, do you think prospects might be slightly jaded and skeptical? In, in that case, um, you'd want to understand what people have promised in the past, you might need to tone down your promise. Um, okay, so let's look at a promise lead real quick. Here we have a very direct promise, the 33% income portfolio. Chicago Wealth Manager reveals how you could generate an immediate 33% annual income from your current portfolio. Very direct promises. And potentially collect $835 or more in the next 30 minutes. I mean, that's like straight up super promises right up front. Probably sent this to a customer list of some sort. Um, but they could also have discovered that this promise hasn't really been talked about by other people in the past. Or they're just thinking, all right, we know people are going to be skeptical about what we're saying here, but if it's true, um, people might still continue reading, um, even if it is a big, giant promise up front. So you're kind of weighing your options there. There's probably not a lot of us on this phone call that are going to be in the uh, in this section um, of your of leads. You're not, probably not going to have this type of lead. But um, I wanted to just show you guys this stuff because also every single lead has a promise in it. So I know that this is a promise lead. I don't want to confuse you with that. But every single lead is going to have a promise of some sort. Um, it's just how, the, how they introduce that promise is whether or not is what determines whether or not it's a promise lead versus some of the other leads we're going to take a look at. Okay. Jump back to the keynote. Problem solution leads. There's gonna be a lot of us that are in this territory. So if you work with a client or you have your own product and they have a, a, a sequence of emails that leads up to a sales page or the opening of a shopping cart of some sort, you're probably gonna to wanna to be in the problem solution lead area, okay? So the ideal time to use a problem solution lead is with a semi-aware prospect. Your prospect should know they have the problem or that, this, that, or that solutions exist, but they're, un, they're likely unaware of you or your particular product. 
In some cases, though, I, I think nowadays having a problem solution type lead on a sales page, you know, who uses these a lot is Ramit Sethi. Um, having this type of lead to start out is great uh, just because it shows so much empathy because what you're doing with problem solution is, is you're saying, I understand this market completely. These are what people, these are the problems that you're having. And you know what? I've developed this solution that's completely unique and new that nobody else has um, developed before. Um, you have a relationship with me. It's more of the, the empathy here with problem solution that is what makes this a good one to use nowadays with online sales letters. So problem solution leads aren't about educating the reader on their problem because they already should kind of know that they have a problem. It's more about making them feel under feel heard and understood. So you start by highlighting their problem. In this case with the paleo thing, it would be, you know, that they're overweight, showing empathy that you fully understand their pain and then leading them towards the solution, which is your product. So you've seen this stuff before. The main driver of problem solution is if this, then that. If you have this problem, then here's the solution. All right, let's take a look at a problem solution lead real quick. This is from VertShock. This is a program on increasing your vertical jump in order to dunk. Um, could have used this in high school, definitely could not dunk in high school, still can't dunk. Um, tried everything to increase your vertical jump, but nothing's worked well. Just imagine hearing the roar of the crowd when you take off on the fast break and throw down a rim wrecking showtime dunk. All right, so if then, right, if you've done everything to try to increase your vertical jump and nothing's worked, then let me introduce you to this product. If then formula in action. Um, and the lead stops right there. So there's a lot of empathy here, showing a picture of him in high school. And also he is, um, he's addressing that people might be skeptical right up front, showing some empathy. People have tried everything before. If you're short, unathletic, tried every program and gimmick before, never dunked a ball in your life, or are super skeptical, already have decent sized jump, I'm about to show you. So he's showing a lot of empathy for the particular types of audiences that might be reading this, this ad right up front. That's what he's doing. This is a problem solution. If, then. A lot of us are going to be in this range. A lot of us. So pay particularly close attention to that lead type if you are writing a sales letter. Okay, secret leads. So this is getting more indirect, right? The job of a secret lead is to create emotional tension by discussing the benefits of a product without actually showing it. So the secret is intriguing and beneficial. It's gonna be introduced in the headline and it's not disclosed during the lead. You don't give up what the secret is during the lead. As the letter progresses, you're just giving more and more clues without actually revealing anything. It's a very powerful type of lead. Um, you don't have to mention the word secret in a secret lead. You can just set something up and then talk about that thing, but you don't actually have to call it a secret if you have like an aversion to using that word. So the way that you come up with the secret lead is you find the secret that's already in the product. If you can kind of uncover something that's, that's secret or different in the product, um, there's a term called transubstantiation. And this means turning something ordinary into something special or into a secret. So take one of the benefits that you have and rename it or reposition it so it seems new or like a secret. So this is a great example from Agora. They have a sales letter that calls their method the China Retirement Fund. And all that this term is, it's used to describe five companies that the prospect should consider investing in. But imagine if that headline was, Americans collect millions by investing in five different Chinese companies. It just doesn't have the same ring. And uh, what's powerful about this is that a headline like this, it instantly removes that thing that people have, especially the skeptical audience of, oh great, I've heard this before. So 
if you call something a China retirement fund instead of five different companies to invest in, you're creating something that's intriguing. Um, and, you know, obviously you need to use this in whatever way you feel is ethical and that you're most comfortable with. But just renaming something is very powerful because it just gets rid of people's skepticism. They, they instantly think, okay, well, I haven't heard this before. Um, so this is a great indirect way to, to start. And it's really good to uh, hit those people that are skeptical about stuff as well. All right, let's go look at a secret lead. This is from Agora as well. Outlaw, outlawed for 41 years, now legal again. This investment, which is the secret, launched the largest family fortune in the, the world has ever seen and could return 665% in the next 12 months. All right, so notice that this is the promise but it's not saying you're going to do that. It's just talking about that return. It's, it's promising you're going you're gonna to learn about this, but in an indirect way. And this is what secret leads do, and that's what uh, story leads do, and that's also what proclamation leads do as well. So you're just talking about this thing without actually stating directly to people that they're going to get this big benefit or that, they're gonna, you know, that you're promising them this result. And if you'll notice, there's a nice little story here, goes in talking about uh, Rothschild and never actually reveals what this thing is, what this investment is. I think that's just, again, that's like another little um, uh, like group of investments, another little group of stocks. Okay, proclamation leads. A proclamation lead is a statement of opinion or fact that startles, intrigues, or interrupts. The key here is to give a relevant statement, but one that pushes the envelope of incredible. So this is like proclamation. This is making projections. Um, this stuff is, is really interesting. It's just kind of attention grabbing stuff. So the, one of the biggest sales letters of all time, direct mail piece was called, the headline was the end of America. And that was a proclamation just saying the world America is going to end and then went on to a, a long discussion about why America was on the verge of collapse. And then what they were selling was a, a guide on how to kind of protect yourself financially from the impending collapse. So that was the headline. The lead um, was a proclamation stating this is the end. Um, you're, you know, I'm going to tell you about why I think it's going to end. Also provided a little bit of proof with um, about the person who had made predictions in the past, which is an important part of a proclamation lead. Uh, and I'm going to skip over that one, mainly because I'd like you to read about it. And especially for the beginner, that is not one that I would necessarily recommend uh, attempting to write in the beginning pretty tough one and it's also one that you have to work with the right company that will allow you a little bit of leeway on that one. All right, scarcity leads. The basis of a scarcity lead is that you mention a limited quantity or time to get what they want in the lead. You make it clear that this may not be here if they leave the page. So in some ways it can be direct, um, but this is also a good, a good thing to use in an indirect way. Um, so this would be an example of a scarcity lead here. Um, no, notice there's no real headline. The only headline you kind of really see is to act fast. Um, but uh, the, the scarcity here is if you're here to claim your personal survival food package, the stockpiler's dream with a guaranteed 25 year shelf life, the package that's being given away as low as $1.10 per serving is being called by some fo folks the number one item to hoard. Um, and then what happens here is that you say that this thing is limited, you have to act fast to get it, and then you have to describe why this thing is limited and talk about the opportunity. And a lot of that is done in the sales argument, which we're 
going to get to in just one minute. Okay, um, another one we're just going to kind of brush over here, but a quiz lead is a question you ask in the form of a quiz at the start of a VSL to build curiosity. So the easiest way to do this is present two to three items. Three is preferable if you can, and ask the pro prospect to choose the correct answer, and then tell them that you're going to reveal the answer in a few minutes. And obviously, what you want to do in this case is you want to you want to have that. What is knowing the answer to this quiz? What is that going to do for somebody? What is the big promise behind knowing the answer um, to this quiz? Um, and I'll just brush over that one because a lot of us probably aren't going to use it. Here's one that you might use. Story leads work best for an unaware or highly skeptical audience. They end by being the most they end up being the most successful lead type. So the most successful ads normally are story leads. There is um, the Wall Street Journal ad that you might have seen. That is a story lead. Um, the two, what's the difference between two, are two college graduates gathered on a bright sunny day? Uh, what was the different, what made the difference? Or one of them was like an executive, the other was still working as a not executive. I don't know what it was. Um, that was a story lead that ended up selling the Wall Street Journal. Um, then there is, uh, they laughed when I sat down at the piano, but when I started to play, that's also a story lead. So these end up being some of the most successful types of leads, mainly because what happens is you're attracting people that aren't even at first even thinking about what you're writing about. You're not starting with something about weight loss sometimes, or it's like not even on people's radar, and then you pick up everybody um, in that particular case. Even people that are like ready to buy right now will sit through a story um, if it seems like it's just like more research that they can do. Uh, so that's uh, the story stuff kind of reaches that mass audience. Um, here are some examples of, of story leads. So meet the man disrupting the billion dollar razor industry. Mad genius unlocks. They hate him. So the meet the man disrupting the billion dollar industry is dollar shave club. So they had that was their ad and headline and how they kind of started uh, the conversation, the big promise um, to people for a while, and I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure if they're still using that particular ad, but that ran for a really long time, and they're now like, I think, a billion dollar company at this point. So, um, Mad Genius Unlocks is another one. I'm sure you've seen the They Hate Him ads. Those are story story ads like why why are people hating this guy and then you read about the story and then you see that maybe he uncovered something crazy or interesting and then you go ahead and buy the product key elements to writing a story lead in your copy one strong idea one desirable benefit one driving emotion one inevitable solution that's what storytelling is okay so let's talk about gary for a second Gary thinks he's going to try a story lead to start. He's guessing. He thinks that this is what he's got to do because this market is so crowded. There's so many people doing things. Or maybe he sees that all of his competitors are using problem solution leads and he wants to try a story lead to start. So he's going to take the most, uh, he's going to take the story of their most successful customer. Maybe it's Jane. And he thinks that Jane's story is the most applicable to all of their clients. He thinks that even the men that are that are listening to this or reading this sales letter will be interested in it. Maybe it's a couple. Maybe it's Jane and Bob. Um, they're a couple and this is what happened to them when they both started doing this together. That would be probably very powerful if they could set it up like that. So Jane, a busy mom and businesswoman who was able to lose 45 pounds by making one simple tweak in her diet. So he decides that the best appeal here is that story, a story of the, one of their most successful customers, and that is what he's going to, to lead with. Okay, so let's say that he chooses a story lead. He wants the headline to be something along the lines of um, how Jane, a busy mom from Austin, Texas, 
a business, a busy mom and businesswoman from Austin, Texas, lost 45 pounds by making one simple tweak, tweak in her diet. Maybe that's how he has a headline like that. That's how he leads it off. And then in the story, in the, in the pages below that, or sorry, like in the first few paragraphs below that, he describes a little bit more about Jane and what happened. And then he also says, and you can learn um, how she did it too. Uh, he could be direct in that way in the lead. And then the next section, he's going to jump into the sales argument, which is talking about the opportunity behind the product, why somebody would want to buy this thing. Okay, so that's the story. That's the story lead. That is the lead. It is a big topic. We've already been going for close to two hours here. Um, let me take another sip of water. And then we are going to get going. So Sam asked, uh, what awareness level should one use for proclamation leads? Uh, that should be in your, well, you know, that's in the problem aware lead uh, area that, I would say a proclamation lead is a tough one. If you've got a projection that you think you can make and you've got a lot of uh, stuff to back you up with that projection, then you can definitely um, go ahead and do it. I just think it's a hard one to start with if you're just starting out just because um, it's not easy to, to nail this stuff and like be able to come up with like that big catchy, almost like a news headline thing immediately. It's more easy to start with some of the other ones. So the, the, the problem aware people, the unaware people will get picked up in the proclamation area. But the cool thing is too, you got to realize is that it's also going to pick up any of these other awareness levels as well. Um, so, you know, keep that stuff in mind. All right. Sales arguments. This is just the middle portion of your sales message. This is when you go in and you describe everything good about your product, everything that makes your product good and would make somebody want to buy it. Sometimes you're just setting up the opportunity. Sometimes you're just talking about the steps and what has happened in the past or what exists in the past that makes your product a very exciting opportunity right now. Um, other times, you're just going to be the, the sales argument itself. If you go very direct, the sales argument itself is just the offer, is just the features and the benefits. And then again, um, it, sometimes this sales argument, there's three different types. Sometimes the sales argument is going to be a myth or myth con misconception, just busting those myths and misconceptions that people have. And you're just walking them through what they be believed in the past and why that was wrong. And then obviously you tie that into your product. Um, so don't overcomplicate this stuff too much. Um, I'm going to show you these things uh, right now. And I hope that actually this stuff will get you excited about this, this middle section as far as like how easy it is to end up writing it. Um, the, the hardest one you're going to have is the lead because you don't necessarily know exactly what's going to be the biggest promise, be the most enticing appeal behind your product. And then in the sales argument section, if your lead is killer, if you got an amazing lead and there's like that big promise that's interesting, different, and then you jump into the sales argument, you've already got people. You've already got them. So then if you've got the, if your sales argument is a myth and misconception and you just run through that stuff, you're going to be fine. Um, so don't worry too much about uh, this section in relation to the lead. So they're already excited. They're already pumped after the lead. And then you get them into this section and you're just saying more good things about your product, really. We're saying more good things about the opportunity that's going to make your product attractive. And you'll understand what I mean by that statement in just one second. So sales argument is just get them feeling like buying the product is the right rational thing to do without making them confused, skeptical, 
Ford board. And then really, like I said, this is what the heck do I say in the middle portion of my sales message. So looking at our lead chart here, our lead choice chart with sales arguments added in, down below is the sales argument choice. So if you go direct, if you've decided you're going to start with an offer lead or a promise lead, then your sales argument is those offer, that offer and those promises. You're just talking about the features and benefits of your product uh, in your lead and also in your sales argument. It's just like a continuation almost. If you go into the problem solution and into the secret territory, and even a little bit further over, you're going to be talking about myths and misconceptions. Very easy stuff. Just break down what people believed in the past and why that's not true. Um, that's basically, and it's in the, and you'll see in the in the fitness industry, this is like the biggest way to do it. People think certain things. They have these certain myths and misconceptions that they hold, and you just bust those myths for them. And that's all that you need to do in order to to set up. Um, the sale, set up your product. In the, if you're going very indirect, if you've got a story, um, if you're in the proclamation scarcity quiz type area, even into the secret area, sometimes you have an urgent opportunity. And I'll just I'll describe that in just a second. But that, that's a, just a very simple. Um, you're just kind of taking them step by step. What do they need to believe first? What do they need to believe second? What do they need to believe third? in order to have your product at that point be set up as the most enticing thing that they can buy. And that works really well with the proclamation stuff. Um, with the story thing, I still think that you can still use the myths and misconceptions one. All right, so <clears throat> this is, these are not rules, but this is just a good way to think about, think about it. If you're going indirect, it's not a rule, but don't mention your product until you actually get to the offer. So you've got your lead, you've got your headline, which, in, you know, you've got your headline and your lead, and then you jump into your sales argument. And sometimes you're going to mention your product immediately up front in the lead, and then you start jumping into your sales argument middle section. And if you're going indirect, at that point, I'd say don't keep like coming back to your product and keep mentioning that I'm going to be selling you something all the time. Just keep talking about the opportunity. Keep talking about the good things um, about what's going to make your product attractive. If it's direct, you can mention uh, the product, but it's best to keep the, the argument going without constantly mentioning that you're going to have them buy something at the end. Just a general rule. So type one, this is just straight up the stuff that we did in the bullet section, in the features benefit sections, um, offers and promises. You're just talking about the, all the good features of your product and, or, you know, if you have limited space, then you got to decide what's the best thing that I can mention, but you're just talking about the offer. You're talking about what things this is going to do. So the benefits in this section of your letter before you close out and go for the sale. Myths and misconceptions. Most of information products and kind of membership stuff, this is a good place to be. Um, online courses, this is a great place to be. Myths and misconceptions. Say you have a product that teaches a different way to accomplish something. Um, as long as your product isn't like a super ripoff, there's probably something different that you're teaching in some way. So you need to talk about those things that are different about what you're doing. The prospect wants to learn a language but is only familiar with traditional approaches. In this case, your argument should go step by step, revealing paradigm shifts. It should bust the common myths that are holding people back. And so you're going to kind of uncover those things during your research phase with, um, you know, with your product. And let me open up one real quick so that we can just take a look at it. This is from Ramit Sethi. Um, and actually, you know what? This was a story lead that I wanted you guys to see, but I guess we can come back to it. Um, this is Ramit Sethi's uh, course. This is um, a 
kind of a promise problem solution type lead. Boom, boom, boom. Sets everything up in the lead, does a lot of empathy stuff in the lead because it's a problem solution lead. And then here's his sales argument. He jumps into mistakes. Mistakes number one, we look for more and more information. And what is he selling in this case? He's selling his brain trust, which is um, access to kind of interviews and access to a community. So he's got a position against the uh, information and like people having too much information, right? So he's positioning against that and he's talking about this mistake that people make, which is looking for more and more information. And then there's another one. There's some proof right there. But that proof in some cases is related to the argument. And then he makes his second, uh, you know, argument here or second mistake. This is another, you know, myths, misconceptions thing. We think we can do, we think we're okay doing it all alone. He's not mentioning his product again and again here. He's just setting up, setting this stuff up and busting these myths as it relates to his product and the opportunity. Goes through all of that. Tells you what those mistakes are going to mean for you. Just a nice little summary here. This is a creation story. This is how this create how this story came about. So part of a uh, sales argument is going to be your creation story, which is how the product came to be. And really, all that is is you're kind of taking um, the feature of your company or your salesperson or the person behind the course and and kind of telling people about the story about how they created the product and all that adds just a lot of proof that's just a really nice proof element that you can add in um, stories can be used as proof like an anecdote so that's a nice little anecdote that you can add in to your sales argument people will read it provides proof it's interesting it's exciting it's how the product came to be and we'll talk about how to structure that in just one second so I just want to jump down okay and then boom, ah, go back up. Introducing Ramit's brain trust. See how that worked? He had a lead, which is a problem solution, showed a ton of empathy, showed you've been trying this, you've been doing this, this is what's been happening. Well, why have you been struggling? Let me break these, uh, these misconceptions that you have. Let me break these myths and misconceptions. Boom, you've been doing this. Um, and ultimately, obviously, you're setting up the opportunity of your product, right? You're setting up why this, why joining a brain trust, why joining a community is going to be good. So he busts that myth, then he busts the next myth, and then at that point, he tells you how he built the product, um, how all this came about in an interesting little tidbit, and then boom, introducing the product. This is the offer, and then here we've got all the modules, so the features, he's got modules. And he describes the benefit of these, mo of these modules, hold each other accountable. Okay, describing the features of the product, describing the modules, describing all of what's in that actual offer. And then after that, he jumps into the close. And there's some testimonials right there, which is actually part of our sales argument as well, or part of our offer. Um, let me just quickly just want to pull back up my, uh, my structure here so we can anchor this. Right? So he had a headline. He had his lead, which showed a lot of empathy. He had this section the myths and misconceptions. Then he had the transitional creation story. These are, sometimes these are interchangeable. You can like mix this stuff up. It doesn't have to be in this order, but this should be in that section. That makes sense? Okay, and then he jumped into the offer, features and benefits, and then he had testimonials. Using it as proof, that's backing up some of the stuff he's claiming. And then he jumps into the close. All right. Back to our sales argument. 
We were just on myths and misconceptions. Now we're at urgent opportunity. A little bit harder to write. What you do is you basically just lay out step by step what's going to make this product um, so great to get. What were the things that happened that made this product become scarce? What were the things that you discovered that made, uh, that made you make that bold prediction about America ending? What happened then? What happened after that? What happened after that? What happened after that? Why is the offer that you're going to get to eventually, why is it so great? Why is it so urgent? Why should people pick it up? And remember, you're not necessarily, especially if you're going indirect, you're not really mentioning exactly what the product is until the offer. Okay? You're coming back to that in the offer, that you're setting up that offer. All right. So what's Gary going to do? Gary decides that because he's in the fitness industry, in the diet industry, he's going to do the, the myths and misconceptions one. He could do a sales argument about the urgent opportunity with his story, but in this particular case, I think it would be best if he chose to go with myths and misconceptions because um, this is just like so good for this particular industry. Um, if information is, it, this type of stuff is really good for information type products. So um, he's going to use Jane's, Jane, let, let's just say Jane and Bob. I kind of like it better as a couple. So let's just say he's going to use Jane and Bob's story um, and what they used to believe in the past and what was actually true. And he's going to talk about maybe them discovering um, paleo principles and what happened then and maybe back up some of those principles with uh, facts from different scientific studies or whatever he's got. Um, I'm not saying, I'm not, you know, speaking to the, uh, how well paleo works or scientifically at all. I'm just saying this is for this particular example. So um, Jane or Bob, uh, he's going to use their story and bust some of those myths. Um, and that will keep it interesting for people if he keeps coming back to Jane and Bob's story and then at maybe at a certain point he's going to mention the creation story of the person that made the product and then at that point he could say let me introduce you to my client I forget what we called her, her name was Cecilia or something so um, he could either introduce her like that if, he, if he's the copywriting voice or maybe it's Cecilia that's the one that's talking about these people and she, she says let me introduce myself etc. All right, um, in a, your sales argument, what you're really doing is you're making some promises, then you're turning those promises into claims, and then you're providing proof to those claims. And you interlace this stuff with stories, you interlace this stuff with secrets and testimonials. Um, you have promises, so your promises are either big promises, you're gonna lose 50 pounds in five days, or like, um, you're going to feel better, kind of a smaller promise. You're going to have a direct promise. You're going to have a promise that might be implied and not directly stated. Claims are simply statements that support promises, and proof is a statement that supports a claim. So a promise might be a new couch helps with allergies. Um, it's going to, or, you know, maybe let's just say couch cures allergies. The claim would be, well, why does that happen? The new fiber doesn't hold dust mites. And then you have proof, a study on that new fiber not holding dust mites. So those are the kinds of things that you're saying within the different varying paragraphs in the sales argument. Proof, the different things that you should add as proof. Scientific studies uh, related to your topic, logical arguments, Experts, uh, quotes from them, uh, compelling, uh, compelling, state compelling facts. Testimonials are great things for proof. If you say something that you can't back up with any other type of proof, then add a testimonial from one of your customers in there. Analogies are great as well. Um, and then real quick, transitional creation stories. So these are just, an, this is just another thing of proof. Um, that this person knows what they're talking about. Um, how to write one, you basically say, 
uh, challenge, what was your problem, the struggle, what did you try on your path to success, all the different things that you tried, the resolution, what was the solution you found. It's just a quick, simple way to write a story. Okay, so uh, for Gary, Gary would tell the story of how his client built her business, Cecilia in this case, built her business, her media appearance, appearances, her best-selling book, and her quick weight loss journey. So if she has media appearances or something, that would be a great time to mention it. Um, if she has a best-selling book, that would be a great time to mention it. You might want to go back to the beginning and talk about how she ended up losing fat in the first place or whatever to start. So that is the sales argument. It's the middle. It's the middle, it's the meatiest portion of what you've got. Um, don't let it confuse you, but the offer is, is considered part of the sales argument because you're still talking about the, the benefit of the product in it, but don't, you know, don't worry about that. So third, the offer, features of your product and their benefit. This is the stuff we already talked about with the bullets. This is where you introduce all the modules, what's in each module, what concept are you describing in there, what that, what's that gonna do, you talk about the length, you talk about all the other features of the product that you've got. Um, either during this or after, throw in your testimonials. You can also throw in your testimonials earlier if you want. So say you have like a secret lead um, and then you're describing this secret in your sales argument um, you could say you could have a testimony that kinds of kind of backs up a statement that you made, even if it's not necessarily related to your product. So um, in this section, you can add in testimonials. So just use them as proof for maybe anything that you weren't able to back up with a claim or sorry to back up with a piece of, of proof like science or um, something else. OK. We have arrived. We have arrived at the close. So what you've done is you've had your lead, you had a promise, there was a big promise, it's either indirect or direct promise, and there was a lead type. So maybe, uh, you know, Gary started with a story about this couple that lost X amount of weight uh, simply by making a few key changes, and then he talked about um, that, talked about how they, they were able to do it, then he, he busted some of the myths, what they were doing in the past, and then this, the changes that they made, he introduced his client, who is the, the creator of the product. Then they introduced the actual offer, what you're going to get when you buy this thing. And then now he's closing it out. Chapter five, the offer. And this is it. So the offer is basically where you tell people what your product is and what it will do for them. You outline the features of your product, what it is and the benefits of those features, what they will do for someone. And so the age old rule here is to focus heavily on the benefits of your product. Um, and again, just kind of a testimonials portion of that, a little bit of repeating here. Um, so Gary uses the bullets he wrote and puts together the offer, like I mentioned, including all those modules, um, including all the different features that we've already listed out. Number six, the close, chapter six. So the order of your close is going to vary a lot. You don't need to lock yourself into any particular order with this close. Um, but this is just a starting ground. This is just, this is a good way to do it. So offer, then jump immediately into the bonuses, then talk about the price, then talk about how you're actually gonna order, how to, how to get this thing. Then you talk about the guarantees that you have. If your client doesn't have a guarantee, you make them add a guarantee. Then you have options, uh, we'll, which we'll discuss. And then at the very end, you could have an FAQ. That sequence seems to work. You can screw with it a little bit if you want. You can add price presentation down further. You can add it up higher before the bonuses. Um, you just need to kind of, there's, you have a little bit of creative license with these particular building blocks. So. Just as long as they're in the end portion, you're going to be fine. OK. Um, let's walk through each of these building blocks really quickly. And um, then we'll get to some questions. 
So false close is a bonus you add to your core offer. So this is just a bonus. That's all it is, right? Um, there are a couple different types of bonuses you can add. You can add a, a bonus um, that is completely related to your product, like it's uh, supplementary, complementary, um, something along those lines, like that recipe book that I mentioned could be a good bonus. Um, you can go back and add new bonuses over time as you discover new things that people might want or they're struggling with. You can look at what other people are adding as bonuses and try to come up with something there. Um, uh, what you want to do is you're just kind of adding extra value to the order. Um, this section is where people are like, you've introduced the offer. Um, people are excited about it. They're starting to think about maybe where their wallet is, whatever. They're starting to think about buying. And then you say, but wait, it gets even better. So that's the kind of, you know, um, cheesy uh, thing that you'll hear on infomercials, but that's this particular section. You can introduce it in what, whatever way you want. You can just call it a bonus. Um, you don't have to say, but wait, there's more. Um, but wait, you get two for the price of one. Um, you can just kind of add in an extra bonus there. It's, it's, it works because people are already excited about the core offer, and then you add in something else. And if you can have something else that they want more than the even offer, <laughs> you're, in my, you're in business. So. Um, Ryan Levesque had a great example of this on a webinar he did for my copy hour people. He had his core survey funnel training um, that he was offering, and then he his bonus was John Benson's VSL course. And that bon when that bonus hit, even I was on the call. I was like, "Whoa, I want that!" So uh, if you can add in a a false close like that, you're going to be in good shape. Um, there's also kind of like unrelated bonuses that you can add. You can add in like um, some sort of item that equals the total price of your of your good of your product, and give people that. So if I was to sell you something like in Copy Hour, um, if I sell you Copy Hour for 500 bucks, and then I add in a bonus that is a $500 um, like let's see what would be a good one like a $500 computer like or like um, iPad or something if I were to add in something along those lines to the bonus that would be a, a really interesting thing that you might want that's not necessarily directly correlated with the product so you can get, you can get in you can get like you can get creative with this stuff and see what works so those are that's a false close it's just a bonus um, then you have the price presentation the, this is the number. The number one goal of your price presentation is to establish a value for your product that is higher than the price you're asking for. So, how do you establish a high perceived value? There are three different ways. Pay close attention to number one, transubstantiation. So, compare the price of another similar product to that that has a much higher price. So, if you have a consulting product, if your client does consulting, then maybe you compare the price of the course to that consulting. My client normally consults with people for $1,000 an hour. Um, you can log into this membership area and get the majority of the benefits for $100 a month or whatever the cost of the membership site or the course or whatever it is. So you compare that higher number to whatever you've got. Another way to do it is totaling the values. So give a value to each module um, and, and then total up those values. And obviously that value is higher than the cost of the actual item and uh, this is actually the liquidating bonus this is the same thing that I just presented to you where if like I were to give away an iPad um, at the same time with it um, so these are th that's kind of interchangeable but the the top two are the ones that you want to pay attention to uh, totaling the values and transubstantiation another is just you'll notice if you ever buy like a SaaS product um, they will say, if you ever talk to a sales guy on the phone, it's always, well, this is normally 100 bucks or this is 120 bucks on our website, but I can give it to you for 60 or I can give it to you for 75, 75 bucks a month, something like that. There's always that drop, that reduction there. Ordering details, this is easy. This is just 
just tell them exactly how to order. That's it. So you have to, if, um, if it's a digital delivery, it would be good to describe the digital process, what's going to happen, what's going to happen after they join, um, why, that that, why that's good. You don't have to wait for shipping. Uh, you don't have to wait for anything to be shipped. You can log in immediately. Um, start talking about the ordering details. Another thing to keep in mind is the more payment options you can add, the better. Um, if you can have PayPal, if you can have all the different credit cards, if you could have a check, if you have a phone number that you can get people to order, um, having, having more different ways to order is, is good. Very simple section. Just you've got to tell them at some point in that close how to order and what's going to happen after they order. That's it. Um, guarantee. So what the guarantee, the main purpose of a guarantee is just to get somebody to knock somebody off the fence. And, and like eliminate that last objection of, well, what if I don't like this thing? Or what if this thing, what if this guy's full of shit and it's not doing what, it, what he says? Um, having a guarantee is just that last thing that gets people off the fence. So you should always, always, always have a guarantee if you can. If you can make your guarantee interesting, uh, you can make it conditional in some cases. Um, for this particular market that we're in, I like having a conditional guarantee. Um, because everybody else, you've, you guys have already seen every single type of guarantee out there in the world. So having a conditional guarantee where you um, are forcing somebody to kind of make that decision, it's a very direct way to approach somebody. You're going to have less sales that way, and you got to kind of weigh the options of whether or not that's good or, or bad. Uh, another thing to do with a guarantee is to add in a, make it, make it an interesting name. So you could call it Derek Johansson's. Uh, crazy limited or 100% money back guarantee. Just giving it an interesting name of some sort um, just adds an extra element of sales to your to your closing guarantee uh, element. Options. Uh, this is another one. It's kind of this is emotional. So a lot of the stuff that you've done so far has been not necessarily um, a lot of emotion in it, and this is. This is kind of adding in that element. Um, so it's a logical argument, but there's also quite a bit of emotion in this. So the, the typical thing you're going to see is you have three options right now. You can keep doing what you're doing and get the same results. Two, you can try to do this on your own and waste tons of time and money. Or three, test drive my product, learn from my mistakes, and start getting the results you want right now. And so there are a couple different ways to set that up. Um, and you know what? I can go ahead and send over, um, you know, little snippets of examples for the close to everybody that's on this call. After we jump off um, by tomorrow, we'll send over some little snippets of each of the, the closes so that you can look at um, real life examples of them. The reason that I don't provide templates is something I should mention right now. I don't, I'm not in love with like a straight up template where I rep, like have you fill in the blanks. I just don't think that that's the best way to do it. Um, first of all, you get a lot of copy that's bland and sounds like other people. You can get in trouble for ripping stuff straight like that. I just don't think that that's the best way to get good at writing copy and to come up with your own voice. Um, and I don't think that's the best way to make sales because you end up sounding like everybody else and people's BS, BS radars uh, start going off. But if you have these particular building blocks and these particular elements in your copy, you're well on your way. Um, and as long as you can kind of adapt these, these concepts in your own voice a little bit, you're going to be better off. But I will provide some examples of this stuff for you guys um, moving forward. Okay. Then there is, at that point, you've pretty much, <clears throat> you've pretty much closed out the letter. You've had that big buy now button, um, you know, with the mention of the, the credit cards that they can use, whatever else. And then at this point, if there are anything, questions that you know that are lingering, you can add a FAQ section um, at the end of it. This works well on a VSL at the very end if people are like sticking around or people just leave their uh, browser open, you could have an FAQ section that just kind of what you're doing is you're reiterating the important selling points. So take a, take really important selling points that you think you have, the big promise type stuff about your product, 
and rephrase that into a question and make it an FAQ and throw that to sign off your sales letter. And that is it. Gary closes it out and delivers his sales page. Those are all of the building blocks, the 14 building blocks of a successful sales message. This is the structure. As long as you have the lead, then the sales argument, then the offer, then the close, you're in business. You should try to add in all of these different types of um, all these different types of building blocks, but there are a few optional ones here. Um, but that pretty much nails it. That pretty much nails it. That's how you write a sales message from end to end, including research and everything else. So let me get to the questions really fast. I'll get to all of these and, um, and then we'll jump off. So here we go. Okay, I know there are, there's no one right answer, but roughly speaking, how long does it take to write your first sales letter in a particular niche using this process versus writing your fifth or sixth sales letter? You've compiled 90% of the research already in the same niche. Um, that's a good question. Um, you know, it's, I, I know, and you, and you said it, there's no one right answer. I think it's really going to, depend on how fast and how much time you have to devote to do the research. But I mean, that first research phase, I mean, phase one goes super fast. Phase two is going to take a lot more time. If you've got really long sales letters to handwrite, if you really have to do a ton of research, I'm thinking like two weeks, one to two weeks to get started, then another week to kind of mold this stuff over, maybe finish up some research, go down some rabbit holes, um, and then another week to actually write. So like a month, um, I think. Uh, Ian Stanley would disagree with me. Ian thinks that you should write a lot faster. But if you're, it, it also depends on your previous experience coming into it. So if you've been writing before, then your editing process is not going to be as long. Cause you're not going to have to like go back and like meticulously edit. So it's such a hard question to answer, man. But I would say like a month for that first one and then um, you can bang stuff out in like a week or shorter for the other ones. Um, I know that Dan Ferrari writing for Motley Fool was talking about it would take him. They would work on sales letters for, for months at a time. Um, just one sales letter. And Ian thought that was crazy because with the credit uh, program that he was working for, the credit repair program, it was like they were testing stuff like super fast within a, like a week or two, um, getting something out. So the time, you know, it's like, it's, it's at least half. Like if you're comparing the time to, to write the first one versus what it takes to write the, the, the subsequent ones in the same niche, it's going to be at least half the time I would say. Um, so I hope that answers your question. When would you stack different sales arguments during the middle section? So during the sales argument, when would you stack the different things? Um, I don't know that I would. Um, I mean, you can definitely make sense of it. If, if you can, if you can make sense of that and that makes sense to you, then I would go ahead and do it. But I don't think that you, it's required to stack the different ones. Um, and I think that, a lot of us, the best thing to do is to just go immediately after the myths and misconceptions one. It's just the easiest one to kind of wrap your, your brain around. So um, myths and misconceptions, obviously, if there are certain arguments that you would like to make related to the overall industry, which direction it's headed, then you can throw those in there. Um, and in a lot of cases with these longer sales letters, like, I mean, they can be 30, 40 pages. So, you know, you can throw as much in there as you want, really. It's um, don't be scared about the length because if somebody's not is if somebody's not feeling it on the length wise, like length never turns somebody off from buying. They'll just go scroll down to the bottom 
and buy it, especially if that first lead section is really on point. So I hope that answers your question. And James, you'll get all this stuff in a uh, in the in the replay and the um, in the follow up stuff. So uh, you know we can go back and look at those slides at a different time. Okay. Follow up. Do you think there's any value in writing a sales letter as a sample and not just for practice, or should you wait until someone hires you to write one? I think there's a lot of value in writing a sales letter as a sample, for sure. Definitely. Choose the industry that you're interested in working in. Choose a product that you like and try to write a sales letter for it. Definitely. I think there's a lot of value in that. Uh, even more value would be in writing a sales letter about yourself, writing a sales page for you and your services. If you're trying to get clients, that would be a ton of value. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely doing a, a sample is great. Okay. Anthony, let's say you've got a paleo food product. People have seen the product type before, typically marketed as organic, but yours is new differentiated because the ingredients are actually better than organic. Grown with no sprays whatsoever, no organic pesticides, fungicides, herbicides. In this case, is the market awareness going to be more on the left because they know the product type generally, or is it more on the right because the problem of organic food actually having pesticides is new? and you have to introduce them to that. Oh man, that's a long question. Um, sorry, I just gotta wrap my brain around this real quick. Say you got a paleo food product. I would say in your case, Anthony, the people are going to be more on the um, more on the unaware side of things. Um, you know what? This is a pretty in-depth question, so I might have to to get to this off webinar just because there's a lot of different elements going into it. Um, Anthony, I just I just took a note of your question, and I'm going to. Uh, email you directly. If you want to email me, I think I've got your your email address, so I'll write this down. Okay. Okay. Uh, another question from James. How does writing uh, sales page copy in this style differ from uh, copy for e-commerce products like clothes, light bulbs, etc.? Looks like this might be overkill for something like that. What do you think? Um, I, you can definitely use the structure, right? I think you can 100% use the structure, especially for like a sales page or home page. If you've got one particular type of product, um, you can use the structure. Um, uh, you know, I don't think there's any problem with doing that. Some of the you have to weigh whether or not you want to use all that space, um, whether or not it's necessary. You got to figure out what the strongest appeal of your of your e-commerce, your physical product is, um, and and go from there. So you might not have to go through all of these different things in order to make a sale, and you're almost just like wasting time at that point. Um, so I don't think that there's any problem with with using the structure for for anything else especially like emails too i think this can 100 percent be used in an email maybe your first email in a sequence is the lead and you build up a lot of anticipation and then your emails two through uh, five are the different sales arguments that you've got and then maybe once you have email six you've now said i'm going to have i'm introducing this product here's the offer send them to your sales page and then emails like seven through 10 are your closing elements um, of the sequence. And maybe each of those emails is one of these particular types here. Okay, so I think you can 100% use this uh, across a lot of different sales environments. I wouldn't use this to write like, uh, you know, a screenplay or something, but in a sales environment, I would, 
say that this would 100% work. Um, e-commerce stuff, uh, definitely, but like with an e-commerce shop that you've got on like Shopify or something, some of this like the clothes stuff probably wouldn't be there. But you can always take out your most successful product and create a little VSL for it. And then you would use this type of stuff to sell your VSL. Ian's selling these fixed water bottles, physical product. He's got a nice VSL selling his pitchers, selling his water bottles, selling his straws. And if you look at any of his stuff on fixed water, he's following these leads, the lead stuff, the sales argument stuff, the offer, all that stuff for a physical product. How does this change when I'm offering something for free? Okay, so when you're doing a, a free offer, right? If you let's say you're doing free plus shipping, that is a direct offer. And so you have an offer lead in most cases. So you're still going to have in your lead, you're going to have your headline, which will probably introduce the offer, which is the free plus shipping, get something for free, um, et cetera. The lead is going to just be that offer um, about the free plus shipping and maybe about whatever that product is or the main driving benefit of that product. And then your sales argument is actually the offer, right? You're kind of almost skipping over some of this stuff in a lot of cases. Um, your, your, your sales argument is here. It's the offer, features and benefits um, of your product and then you kind of jump out here and you probably don't need the FAQ. Um, you might not have a false close. I don't think it would hurt, but you're, you're going to do this price positioning. You're going to do the ordering details. You should have a guarantee. Uh, you may, you might want to skip over options, but um, it should still be the same. Shorter question. You mentioned using this on a home page, but with a lot less text. Can you elaborate? Yes. So if you are making a home page, what you can do is take a lead. You can take what your offer. Oh, actually, let's do, let, let me move back. You can you have an offer, right? That's what your product is. So you take what you think is the biggest, strongest benefit appeal of your product and you put that up front as the headline on your home page and that's it and then your lead could probably be something related to that big benefit um, it could be kind of subhead almost materials um, but more just like you have the you're expounding upon that major big benefit appeal of your product um, down below, maybe it's below the fold, that could be considered your lead area. And then in some cases, you're just going to jump straight into the offer, um, which would be highlighting the features and benefits of your product. So if you're like got a SaaS product or something, you're talking about the features um, of the, the, the SaaS uh, system that you have. And then what are those benefits? But you're, you know, obviously when you're talking about features and benefits, you want to focus heavily on the benefits. So you, you're, fo you're, you know, you're talking about those individual different types of, of features um, and their benefits. I'm sure you're going to have testimonials on your homepage, but it, like all the stuff is kind of quick and pithy, you know, like you're, you're, it's not necessarily drawn out into a long, 30 page thing there have been, I've seen home pages that are extremely long and I don't think you can go wrong, but a lot of people don't want to do that. A lot of clients don't want to do that. Sometimes it's not necessary. So, um, anyways, that's, uh, that's what you can do. You might not have some of the closing elements on there that might be reserved for another page, but you could add in some bonuses on that particular page. Um, you, you might present your price, on that on the home page um, you can add in all of this stuff it might just be slightly abbreviated and more just like pithy so does that make sense I think that it can 100% work the structure here and we actually use that on our on our home page how would this work if I'm selling something like addiction 
counseling. So do you have a product like what's what you're selling is a consultation for people that have um, addictions? I mean, you would write a sales page at some point for your services. So you figure out based on that person's addiction, what your most powerful benefit is, what your most powerful appeal is. And you throw that up into the headline and your lead. And then you could, you know, you're probably going to work through some myths and misconceptions in the sales argument section. And then you've got your offer, which is the services that you're providing. Um, and then you've got the close. You could potentially, I don't know if you do selling via the phone or it depends, but I, I think you could definitely have a sales page for selling those services. So I think that that, that would definitely work. Have you noticed any recent breakthroughs in terms of new VSL techniques or formats? Um, that's a little bit outside of the scope of what we're, we're doing here. Um, but uh, we can talk about that off, uh, off this call in, in, the, uh, in the Facebook group, if you'd like, just uh, the Facebook copy hour group. Um, promising format changes. I mean, okay, so like some things that are new. The quiz stuff is definitely really new and interesting. Scarcity stuff is new and interesting um, that you didn't really see in the past as far as stuff that that people are doing. But again, we can we can talk about that stuff kind of off off topic here. All right. Ryan, what if I'm using postcards as the first touch point with the prospect? This is there's much less space on a postcard for copy. Um, well, see, that's that's something that's a little bit different. That's how you're driving traffic to a sales letter. So, in that particular case, that would probably be something that's more like a lead generation thing, where there's a lot of curiosity built in order to get them over to the the sales page it's, it's, itself. Um, you could almost think of like that as like a teaser on an envelope that gets them to open um, open the envelope. And in that case, you need to kind of grab attention and then get them curious and then get them to go ahead and click over to the next page. So it's a, it's different. It I you know I don't know on your postcard if you necessarily have all of these various elements on it. You'd probably be more in like that lead territory because you're building up that interest, you're building up that excitement, getting them to click over. More of like a display ad almost type situation. Okay, just scrolling back through, seeing if I missed anything glaring. If you had a, a big question that you wanted answered, uh, go ahead and just post it back down below, copy and paste it if you wouldn't mind, just so I make sure I don't miss any of these. And like I said, Anthony, I'll get to yours off of this webinar. Jesse said, I actually turned this content into a mind map. Oh, awesome. I'll definitely get that out to people in the, in the future. Okay, cool. All right, well, I think I've got to most of the questions here. Again, this is something where if you have a question that you want answered off of this webinar, um, go ahead and shoot me an email and I'll definitely get to it. Anybody that's here, um, anybody that obviously paid to be here, please go ahead and send an email and we'll definitely get to you guys get to those questions and uh, make sure that, that you've got everything that you need. We've got replays. I've got all kinds of stuff coming your guys' way um, as far as uh, resources and materials related to this presentation. Um, and you'll be getting those in the next couple of days. And you'll certainly have them by this weekend. So thank you guys very much uh, for stopping by today. This was almost a, almost a three-hour call, so very cool. Um, oh, wait, here we go. Uh, recording within recording by tomorrow. I just need to make sure it gets all processed and everything's good. How would different copy formulas work into this? Could it, we get a PDF of the slides? Yes, we're going to get a PDF of the slides. Um, and uh, yeah, we're going to have all the recordings, all the materials, everything ready to go 
for you guys. Um, okay, wait, I got another question from Jason. Sorry, guys, just having some of these final questions pouring on. I want to make sure I get to them. If my product is an ebook and the only competitors for the subject are all video, am I in stage one or stage two? You're in stage two because it's, it's, it's not necessarily the format that's the thing. It's the actual product or the problem that it's solving. So you would be in stage two in that case. If you have competitors that are selling the same solutions as you, then you would, you would be in the stage two area. Depending on what it was, if it, it, like with an ebook, that, that makes sense to me. With an ebook, you're in stage two. Um, with a brand new product that's like in a different medium, then you would almost be in, you would be in like stage one with market sophistication. Can we use this process to sell our freelancing service? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> you know, you, th use it to make a sales page, man. Like start with a headline that's going to attract your ideal uh, client and work from there. I mean, look at what, look at some of the stuff that Gary Halbert did. Um, his stuff falls into this category. His stuff definitely followed a sequence that looked a lot like this and he was selling his his services that way so you can definitely use this stuff for that if you recommend a book to read um, great leads is the is definitely a book you should read influence by Cialdini is another one to start just for kind of general principles but uh, great leads as far as books for copywriting goes that's going to be one that's going to give you a, a big big breakthrough and check out that reading list. So copyhour.com slash reading dash list. There's a, there's a bunch on there that I think you're really going to like. Okay, like I said, if you have any other, any further questions, please just uh, email me and we'll make sure we get to those and I'll be sending over a lot of materials to follow up on this in the next uh, few days. So you guys have a good night and I will hopefully talk to a lot of you very, very soon.